Thank you, Rosna. Good morning, everyone. It is indeed a joy for us to be back and share fellowship with you. Thank you, Brother Keith, for inviting us. You know, we really appreciate you. We really love coming here. I, I, you know, I was saying to Keith last night, um, you may or may not appreciate this, but when you sort of travel around different churches, you, you really do. I mean, what you have here is not the norm. I can tell you, when you come, you go to many church services, before they begin, you do not see the saints praying earnestly and passionately like you do here. You don't see people with such a hunger and a zeal for the Word of God and to talk about the Lord incessantly. That is not the norm. It should be. (laughs) But believe you me, it's not. Somebody once said that the church has become subnormal. That when it begins to look normal, it looks abnormal. Meaning when we start to recover what the church should look like, as we read about in the New Testament, it's a shock to the system. People can't handle it. It looks abnormal. But may we be abnormal for the glory of God. I want to read uh, just one verse in this first uh, session. And it's the last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's a well-known verse. You're all familiar with it. But I trust that the Lord will use it to speak to us this morning and to bless us through it. Verse 18, we read these words. But we all, we all, no exception, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And this morning I'd like us to consider the goal of our salvation, the purpose for which God saved us. I want us to consider that God's goal in saving you in me is that His image be seen in us. His image be restored in us. I want us to consider that God has saved us. God is sanctifying us for that purpose that His image be restored in us. And in this verse we we read that as we behold in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are being changed, transformed. You know, we come to Christ. We come in repentance and faith. We call upon His name. But if we remain unchanged, something isn't right. We do not stay the way we are. Mm -hmm. We come as we are, but we don't stay that way. We are being changed. We are being transformed. Paul the Apostle wrote these words, but he restated the same sentiment in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And somebody actually referred to this in praying this morning. In Romans 8, 29, Paul writes that God has predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. And this morning, I want us to consider The goal of God saving us, the goal of His sanctifying us, is to transform us and conform us to the image of Christ. I I don't know what initially comes to your mind when you hear that word image. And all kinds of thoughts might come when we hear the word image. You might think of the term we use, so-and-so is image conscious. You might think of the corporate world where branding and advertising and image is everything. But often this word image is used to compare the features of a child to its father or mother. Since Rosalind and I have been here last, I see a couple of babies have joined the church. That's wonderful. Church growth, that's great. But very often people use the term image when they look at a newborn baby 
a young child toddler, and they'll say things like, he is the image of his father. She is the image of her mother. It's a term used to express a likeness in appearance. And incidentally, just in that kind of thinking, whenever baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem, I know it's not Christmas time, but when, the, when Christ was born, when the wise men and the shepherd came to look at him, not one of them could say, he is the image of Joseph. That's right. They couldn't say it. Because Joseph was not Jesus' father. As Paul reminds us, God is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not the image of Joseph. But as the writer to the Hebrews tells us, he is the express image of God, the express image of his person, the exact representation of his being. He's not the image of Joseph, but he is the image of God the Father. What does that exactly mean? It's not describing a likeness in appearance as we would a child to its parent. Because you see, God is spirit. And they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He is spirit, but Jesus is human. He is God in human form. The word who was God became flesh and dwelt among us. So whenever we read of Jesus being the express image of God, he being the image of the invisible God, as Paul says to the Colossians, it's not speaking of a likeness in physical appearance. It's speaking about the nature and character of God. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In other words, he's saying, you want to know what God's like? Look at me. You want to know about the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the judgment of God? Look at Jesus. He is the express image of God, the exact representation of his being. He's the image of God. Now, let's take it a step further. Let's get personal here. Let's, get, let's bring this to the individual level. Because we read that we are created in the image of God. We're being transformed. We're being changed into his image. But we essentially are created in the image of God. Now, what might that mean? I want to suggest to you what that means is simply. We are like God. Now, hear me carefully. We are like God in certain albeit restrictive ways. We are like him in the sense we know right from wrong. We know what is morally right. We know what is morally wrong. We are like him in the sense we have the ability to reason. We have the ability to think, to make decisions. And Brother Keith was exhorting us to make that decision, make that decision of the will to rejoice in the day, today that the Lord has made. We're like him in the sense that we are creative. That's why I said in restrictive sense, we're not creative like in the sense of God as the creator, but he has given us creative abilities. There is creativity in the body of Christ. Again, testament that we are created in his image. But because of sin, because of one man's disobedience, Sin entered into the human race. And as a result of that, the image of God in mankind has become corrupt. It has been distorted. It's like if you've ever looked at your reflection in a pool of water. Anybody ever done that? Looked at your reflection in a pool of water. And if you were to get a stone and throw the stone into the pool of water, you see ripples, and you can no longer see your reflection clearly. It has become distorted. And that's exactly what sin has done to the image of God in mankind. It has corrupted. It has distorted God's image. And that is, the why, God, that is why God has saved us, why God is sanctifying us to restore his image in us, that he might be seen in us, that Christ may be seen in you 
and in me. Whenever society, be it a city, a town, a village, whenever a community of people erect a statue, the sole purpose is to honor the person, the memory of the person in whom that statue has been erected. It's the sole purpose is to stimulate conversation about the person that that statue commemorates. Was that person a good person? Was that person noble, kind, controversial, and so on? We are created. We're not statues. We're, we're living, we're breathing, but we bear the image of God, our creator. We're created in his image. And he has called us as his image bearers to reflect that image in this dark, fallen world. That People look at you. People look at me. Will they talk about the Lord? Do they see something of Him in our lives? How we live our lives, how we express ourselves, how we communicate with others, how we interact with others. Listen to what Paul says. He says, having put off the old self with its practices. It's nearly like changing clothes, the, 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 the imagery here. Having put off the old self with all of its practices, the old way of living, <clears throat> and having put on the new self, living as a new creation in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. He goes on to say, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. God is restoring his image in you. He's restoring his image in me. And you know how he does that? <clears throat> He does that as we begin to walk in his ways, walk in his word, respond to situations the way Jesus would. He does it as we are being led by his spirit, as we're seeking first the kingdom, honoring him, putting him first, essentially living a life of total surrender to him. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, you all know what I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind in order that you might prove and discover that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. That transformation is bound up in the presenting of our bodies, in our laying our lives down at his disposal, no strings attached. And as we do that, see, these are not two separate categories. They're all bound up. As we do that, something takes place within that affects our very mind, our very thinking, which affects our very conduct. Where there's a transformation takes place. God at work with us by his spirit, creating that good work that will, who he, and he'll bring it to completion. Paul says, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror. You know, the city of Corinth was famous in antiquity for its mirrors. This is the second time Paul uses the mirror. <clears throat> as an illustration. He does the same thing in 1 Corinthians 13 towards the end. We see through a glass darkly. And here he's using the, the mirror again as a metaphor to it, to illustrate what he's saying. He says, as we behold as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into the same image from glory to glory. And what he's saying here, as we look in a mirror, what we are seeing reflected back to us is not our reflection, but what is being reflected back to us is Christ, whose image we are bearing. And as we behold him, and I like that term behold. Do you remember when Jesus was about to be baptized and he was standing in line with all the sinners at the, at the River Jordan? What did John say? He didn't say Look at that man over there. Do you see that man? He didn't say that. What did he say? He said, behold, yes. the Lamb of God. Be in awe of him. Fix your gaze on him. And Paul is saying, as we look in the mirror, beholding him, what is being reflected back is not our own reflection, but Christ, whose image we are bearing. 
And the more we behold him, the more we fix our gaze on Christ, we are becoming like him. Something is happening. What did the religious people say of the, 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 the disciples? They took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. And as we behold him, keep him front and center, ensure he gets the preeminence. As we behold him, we are being changed into his likeness. Beholding him. As we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into the same image. You see, there's a principle in Scripture, and it's simply this. You become like what you worship. We become like who or what we worship. We worship Jesus. We honor Him. Something is at work within us. His image is being restored by His Spirit within us. We're becoming like Him. But the opposite is true. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 115, he repeats it in Psalm 135. He says, those who make and trust in idols become like the very idol. You become like what you worship. Those who create and trust in idols become like the idols, lifeless, devoid of any kind of spiritual life. And by the way, An idol is not necessarily some kind of statue made of wood or stone. It can be anything or anyone that we allow to come between us and the Lord. But we become like what or who we worship. We want to become like God. You know, the most famous incident probably in the entire Bible of idolatry was when the children of Israel worshipped the golden calf. Do you remember that? And as the psalmist said, and I think the psalmist was referring to that, you become like what you worship. Because interestingly, when you read about the nation of Israel, they are described with words and phrases that are descriptive of cows and cattle. Israel is described as being stiff-necked, like a young calf being dragged into the enclosure and the calf resisting. Israel are described as having, as a people, they're as having broken loose. If you know anything about cattle, they're always breaking out. And in fact, Israel was called, through the prophet Hosea, a stubborn heifer. They worshipped a calf idol and they became like the very idol they worshipped. May we be a people who continually worships God. We want to be like Him. We want people to see Him in and through our lives. As we behold Him in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into the same image from glory to glory. Notice the two words there. Glory and image. Everything God does is for His glory. And that includes conforming us to the image of His Son. You see, God's goal is glory. That's His goal. The writer to the Hebrews tells us that the Lord is leading many sons and daughters to glory. Colossians 1.15, Christ who is our life, when He appears, we will appear with Him in glory. In 1 Peter, Peter says He was a witness to the sufferings of Christ, but also will be a partaker of His glory. God's goal is glory. We are conformed to the image of His Son, and that process will be complete. Paul says, when we're glorified. And that happens when the Lord returns. He comes to be glorified in His saints. But God's goal is glory. But because of sin, you all know what Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That which God has destined us for, because of sin, we have fallen short. But He sent Jesus, His Son, to redeem us, to to save us. And when we call on Him, repent, and trust in Him, 
we are repositioned. We're back on track. And we can say with Paul, Christ is in me and I have the hope of glory in my sights again. That which I am destined for. God's goal is glory. But as we behold in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into the same image. Here's this word again. From glory to glory. From glory to glory. And I want to suggest to you that we first encounter God's glory. Whether you've been aware of it, whether you've ever thought of it, I want to suggest to you we first encounter God's glory the moment we put our trust in His Son. The moment we were born again, we encountered the glory of God. In the next chapter, I'm just going to read a few verses from 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of... Notice the gospel here. It's described as the glorious gospel. That's just not a nice phrase, by the way. It's all about the glory of God. The glorious gospel of Christ, again this word image, who is the image of God should shine into them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory, there it is again, of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We first encounter the glory of God at salvation. Verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ Jesus. This here, verse 5, is the language of creation. If you contrast verse 5 with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and following, what do we read? In the beginning, the earth was without form or void, and darkness covered the deep. Darkness in the beginning. And the Spirit of God moved over the darkness, and God said, let there be light. That's the language of creation. And here Paul is saying, and he's showing us a parallel. In every unsaved heart, there's darkness. Every unsaved heart is dark. Darkness covers that heart like darkness covered the earth way at the beginning. But in every unsaved heart, as the saints of God pray and witness, the Spirit of God begins to move in the darkness, bringing conviction. And all that has to happen is for the Lord to speak, let there be light. And he speaks his word through you and me. As we share this word with unbelievers, as we speak this word to unbelievers, God speaks his word through us. And the light of the glory of God, the light from the glorified Christ, shines into that dark heart and dispels it. And you know what happens? A creative act. Creation. New creation. The gospel is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Paul was very upset with people who he described as being peddlers of God's word, who were tampering with the word of God, with the gospel. The gospel, if we think just how it is described and the implications, it is about the glory of God. What comes to your mind when you hear about the glory of God? Maybe you think of Moses and Mount Sinai. You know what is interesting about this word glory? In the Hebrew, it's descriptive of something of considerable weight, heaviness. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 speaks about the eternal weight of glory. What happens... Whenever a heavy object comes in contact with a lighter object, 
There is displacement. If you can imagine for a moment a lake or a pond frozen over, if you were to take a, a breeze block or something heavy and hurl it down, the moment it would come in contact with that ice, there would be displacement. Cracks would appear because the ice has to reorientate itself to accommodate the weight of the heavier object. And in the Bible, when you read about the glory of God descending, there is displacement. When the glory of God came on Mount Sinai, there was shaking. There was trembling. When the glory of God fill, uh, filled Solomon's temple, the weight of glory, the priests could not stand to fulfill their duty. When Isaiah had the vision and the glory of God came, there was shaking. And when an unbeliever gets truly born again, there mightn't be lightning or smoke, but I'll tell you one thing, there will be a shaking. Their whole lives will be shaken. They'll be turned inside out, upside down. There will be displacement of their priorities, their goals. And there will be a reorientating, an accommodation to receive and accommodate the glory of God in their lives and what God has done and the new life they have been saved to live. There will be a shifting. There will be a reorientating because of the glory of God present in the gospel. If something like that does not happen, then I would question whether someone's truly born again. Your life can never be the same again when you encounter the glory of God. But we are being changed into the same image from glory to glory. That's where we first encounter the glory of God at salvation. When we next will encounter it is when He returns. He's coming in glory. Christ, who is our life, when He shall appear in glory, we shall appear with Him. He comes to be glorified in His saints. That's when our salvation is complete. Yeah. New glorified body. God is working in us. His image is being restored and preparing us for that day because He's coming for a perfect bride, beautiful bride, a red and spotless white linen. And what He's doing in your life and my life, He's working towards that end. He's working in your life. He's working in my life. He never stops working. Because He's continually molding us and shaping us in accordance with His will, His plans and purposes. Last Sunday I was speaking from Jeremiah 18, where Jeremiah observed the potter at work on, with a clay. And not only was the potter pressing the clay and kneading it and stretching it, he was also controlling the momentum, the speed in which the wheel would turn. Because everything God does, he does in accordance with his perfect timing. There are seasons, there are cycles in our walk with the Lord. And sometimes, you know, it feels like nothing's happening. Sometimes the wheel seems to be just slowing down and coming to an almost standstill. And other times it's going so fast, we can't keep up. One prayer after another is being answered. But as the potter was shaping the clay, God is shaping us. He's restoring His image in us that we might be seen in Him. Can we pray? Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are all works in progress. We haven't all got it together. But I'm thankful that he who has begun a good work within us will be faithful to complete it to the day of salvation. The potter was committed to the clay. And even when you might be feeling the pressure, as Rosna was sharing the pressure, the hand of God at work, be encouraged. It means you're never far from God's hand. He's at work in your life and in my life. And Father, I pray that you would just help us as we appreciate afresh what you're doing in our lives, restoring your image within us, that you might be seen, not us, but you. Father God, help us to surrender daily. 
to daily take up the cross and say, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Help us, Lord, to always put you first, to respond in situations in the way you would have us respond, the way you would have responded. Father God, help us. Help us in Jesus' name. May we know your grace. May we know your strength, your power. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.